Now, the science of transformation says this, cognition or learning is just one way to, to transform yourself. You can watch a TED Talk, you can listen to a podcast, and that's cognition, and that's, that's good. But what if you could increase your transformation 500%? Listen, I'm, I'm really excited to have you on. One of the things that fascinates me about you is the how talented you are in terms of your speaking skills, so the ability to articulate your message and to be able to communicate that to, to others. I mean, I was listening to your talk with a friend of mine, and I think this was a couple of years ago, and just your, mm-hmm. your ability to translate your message to the audience from a digital screen as well. I mean, it comes across just watching you from YouTube, I'm sure it's a different experience live. Is that just something that you've developed over time or is that something you've always had from a young age? Well, uh, who was the friend who I was speaking to? Uh, No, no, no. it was a friend of mine that was watching your talk. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Got it, got it. So so when it comes to speaking, okay, there's basically four things, four things. Now, many speakers talk about style and style style matters there is a style of storytelling there is a style of speed um so in terms of style stylist in terms of stylistic stuff i've studied with some of the best speaker trainers uh, many of them are on mind valley lisa nichols is probably one of the best in the world she has a program on mind valley called speak and inspire um check it out mindvalley.com forward slash speak so i trained with lisa and um i learned storytelling through her I learned to slow down my voice. I learned techniques such as show me, don't tell me, which is basically using your hands to emphasize key points. You'll notice I do that a lot. Mm. I learned the technique from her called the valley, which is where before you talk about your accomplishment, you talk about your lowest point, your valley, because that's real. That's what resonates with the audience. So all of that fall under style. But there's a second component. And that second component is cognition. Cognition means... The input output of your brain is operating at peak efficiency. So here's what I mean by cognition, right? Many of us forget, forget to prime our brain. And so we may have a Ferrari brain, but we are driving it at maybe 30 miles per hour. Why? Because the things that actually influence our brain, we fail to do. Now, one of the biggest things is sleep. We fail to sleep sufficiently well. There was a study done of, um, um, on sleep. And it showed that if you deprive yourself of 19 minutes of required sleep, one third of your brain shuts down. One third. It's it's stunning. And sharpshooters, so so marksmen who have a 90% accuracy, if they just cut back on one hour of sleep, it goes down to 75%. They cut back on two hours, it drops down to like 50%. So sleep is important. So when you think of your brain, think of input output. Like how fast are you taking stuff in? How fast are you getting stuff out? So if your brain is operating well, when you deliver a talk, instantly stuff comes out. You can ask me any question and I can bring stuff out. This is the first time I'm answering a question on how I became a speaker, or at least the first time in recent memory. But notice it looks like I've written a book on it. It's Mm. because my brain has already processed this. I've already figured out the four steps and I'm outputting them right now. Input, output, or the IO of your brain. So sleep is one. Uh, Supplementation is another. Exercise is a third, meditation is a fourth. Okay, so that that's number two. Now, number three is not so commonly spoken about, but extremely important, intuition. If training your brain is important, training your soul is also important. Training yourself to listen to that still inner voice within. That voice is often the source of so much creativity, so much insight. Many great inventors from Edison to Tesla, have listened to that voice to produce their inventions. Great musicians like Robbie Williams have spoken about how some of their best written songs came to them, came to them when they listened to that voice. Intuition is one of the ways I I know what to say at the right time. The best speakers I've put on stages uh, around Mind Valley have been people who, for lack of a better word, they channel. 
They listen to their intuition and they channel. Now, the fourth one is connecting with the audience. Connecting with the audience is respect to the interviewer. It's respect to the audience that you're on. I do a an exercise before getting on stage anywhere. And in that exercise, I visualize the audience I'm speaking to and I just fill them with love. And I set an intention that I'm going to deliver the right conversation at the right point. So I respect your audience. I, I respect you, which is why before we started, I asked you all these questions about your projects, your life. I asked for your permission before I brought a glass of wine onto the set. Um, it's respect. And so these four things, when you put them together, you start to become a great speaker. Now, any of these things, you can go deep and you can extract and extrapolate and you can truly study intuition, truly study respect, truly study style, truly study cognition. Um, and I've done those. I've, I've gone deep into all of these things. But when you start doing that, your speaking style and your ability to deliver to an audience transforms. Yeah, I mean, just I noticed the small things that you do, particularly when you're speaking with me, is just you're, you're able to pause at a certain point that, where most people are afraid of the pause. They're afraid of the uncomfortable silence because right. it makes them feel awkward and they try to fill that void. Whereas a lot of good actors and, and great speakers like yourself, they're able to pause and feel comfortable and almost make the audience question themselves, right? You're kind of right. playing games with the audience a little bit like, oh, like, is he, is he trying to say something else? Like, what, what, is he okay? And then you deliver that message of the punchline or whatever it might be. And uh, it, it is such an important thing that, that we need to learn for sure. How do you transform information into practice in, when you were able to get the tool sets? Okay, so, so that, that's, really, that's a really good question. So to answer that, you have to look at transformational theory. Now, the science of transformation says this, cognition or learning is just one way to, to transform yourself. You can watch a TED Talk, you can listen to a podcast, and that's cognition, and that's, that's good. But what if you could increase your transformation 500%? You go from one to five, five different techniques. So cognition is one. The second one, even more important than cognition, is critical reflection. Critical reflection means you pause, you pick up a pen, you pick up a journal. I have journals everywhere. This is yeah. the journal on my desk right now. I have a journal oh. by my bedside. I have a journal hang, hang, hanging on my ceiling. <laughs> critical reflection. And you write down, you write down what is going on in your head. This is why journaling is such a powerful habit, right? So for example, I spoke about the four things to become a better speaker. If this was a class, I would ask to pause and I would say, okay, I'm going to give you five minutes. I want you to write down first, what is an aspect of speaking style that you use? When was the first time you started noticing that your intuition could be trusted? What is an example? What was an example of a situation where your cognition, your brain was operating truly like a Ferrari? What did you do differently? And the fourth thing would be, give me an example of a speaker you've seen who really resonated with you because of the respect he gave his audience. So you see what I just did? I took what is cognition and I turned it into critical reflection. Cognition is input. It's inputting information into your brain. Critical reflection is output. You're priming your IO switch. So now you've doubled your rate of learning. Now let's go on to the third one. The third one is social discourse. It means you discuss with a friend. So let's say you were listening to this podcast with a friend. After you guys put down your critical reflection, you share it with each other and you discuss it, maybe over a drink, maybe over dinner. Social discourse is a great way to learn from each other because your friend might have insights as well. So, you know, learning as a group is, is, is really important. One of the things that made Mind Valley successful is that all our learning programs come with community. In fact, we just launched our own social network for learners to compete with Facebook because Facebook is so destructive. So we launched our own social network so that learners can learn from each other. So that's, that's, that's social discourse. Now there are two more. Okay, now the two more uh, are this. The, the next one is rate of application. Rate of application means, great, you just learned something. Can you apply it today? Can you apply it today? So before talking to you, I was interviewing Shafali Sabari, the, uh, the author of the book Conscious Parenting. And she was teaching techniques to communicate better with your child. I'm going to go have dinner with my kid. I'm immediately going to apply one of those techniques mm. to communicate what were, better with my son. What was one of those son. techniques? Well, you we don't have to go deep into it, but it was, it was about authentic vulnerability. Sharing your, your, your vulnerability with your kids so they know that they can be vulnerable with you. 
right? Mm-hmm. So as I have dinner with my kid, I'm just going to share something, maybe a worry, maybe something that that I'm feeling right now that I just think you know would be useful for him to know um, what I'm feeling and how I process that feeling because it gives him permission to be open about his feelings too. So that's rate of application. You learn, you apply. You learn, you apply. You learn, you apply. And the final one is my favorite of all. But first, any questions? <laughs> no, I want to. I want to hear what this is. Okay. Now, by the way, did you notice what I did over there? I left an open loop. I said the final one is my favorite of all, and and that's an open loop, so it keeps the person um, uh, hooked, right? And also notice, I said, I'm going to teach you five techniques. And then I went into each five. So the fifth one is this, altered states. Altered states means as you learn this, you actually meditate. You go into an altered state and you process it. In our public speaking program with Lisa Nichols, mindvalue.com forward slash speak, it comes with an audio, a meditation audio that you listen to on Mindvalley's meditation app that guides you into a creative visualization where you see yourself on stage as a remarkable speaker. That audio shifts your belief system in your brain. What maybe once you feared, you start to expect. You start to turn that fear into excitement. And studies have shown that when you visualize something, it's more likely to happen. That's an example of using altered states in learning. In almost every program we do right now, even business programs, we bring in altered states. We have NLP professionals, hypnotherapy professionals, meditation professionals who come up with scenarios where you can be guided into an altered state, tapping into typically the alpha or theta brainwave frequency and reprogram your brain with new beliefs that change your perspective on life. When you put all five of those together, you become a truly remarkable teacher. And if you're a student and you bring in those five things, you truly transform. Mm. And when you say altered state, are you talking about visualization through words or just through thinking with your own mind? Or could altered state be taking a cold shower? Could it be hopping into a sauna? Could it be working out and changing your brain waves as well just through exercise? Exactly. Exactly. So there are many ways. There are many ways. I guess Stephen Kotler says that in the Western world, we've been trained to live in a monophasic uh, state. Monophasic means we live at the waking frequency. Now, this is scientific. You can measure this using an electroencephalograph. 15 to 21 cycles per second is the waking state. But when you meditate, you slow that down to 7 to 14 cycles per second or the alpha level. Now, what studies have found, primarily studies by Jose Silva, who founded the Silva method, is that when you're in this relaxed state, 7 to 14 cycles per second, whatever you visualize, your brain starts to believe is true. If you visualize perfect health, your brain starts to believe you have perfect health the placebo effect kicks in. If you visualize yourself on stage, your brain starts to believe that you are comfortable. You are you are powerful on stage. Right. I just got a message from one of my students who cleared her skin. And um, she's, a, she's an actress. And so skin is really important to her. She said for the first time, for the first time, she has radiant skin without makeup. She was using a creative visualization that I designed to heal skin. Now you can find this. Go to, go to YouTube. Uh, search creative visualization, vision, V-I-S-H-E-N, and you'll find all of my creative visualization trainings completely free, right? But this is one of the most powerful ways, but you're doing it in an altered state called the alpha brainwave frequency, which is a state where you can reprogram your beliefs and your mind, and even in a way, talk to your body to induce healing. Wow. Okay. This wasn't like a proactive ad or something like that. We should put different skincare on to clear those acne. I mean, this, this seems. No, this, no. I, actually, I believe it. It just. I. I know people are going to sound. This is voodoo. You know. This is. This actually, is stuff it's not. That, in fact, in fact, it's called psychodermatology. See, people have a habit of calling things voodoo, but they just haven't educated themselves. Google psychodermatology. The skin is the part of the organ most susceptible to human thought. Psychodermatology teaches visualization to influence the skin. A hypnos, a, a hypno, a good hypnotist can put you in a hypnotic trance, tell you you are on a beach getting a tan, and your skin will tan. Jose Silva would do a demonstration where he would hold up, he would hypnotize someone, hold up a, 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 a marker, tell that person this is a red hot poker, put it on their skin, and a burn bubble would form. He would then take his hand, put it on the skin, and the burn bubble would disappear. All 
through auto suggestion. Have you ever been this hypnotized as well? Me? Yeah. Um, so, so an interesting phenomenon on, on, on hip, uh, hip, hypnotherapy is this. If you meditate regularly, you are learning to stay awake in altered states in alpha and theta. So if you meditate regularly, it's harder for you to get hypnotized. But oh, hypnotherapy does work. Hypnotherapy does work. I just got back from uh, seeing Paul McKenna in London, one of the world's foremost hypnotherapists. Now, Paul McKenna helped me solve a health problem instantly. It was amazing. It, it's very personal, so I'm not comfortable sure. sharing it. Of course, it. of course. But um, when you say, can you be hypnotized, it depends on what level you're talking about. Are you talking about a, hypno, a, a hypnotist making you forget who you are momentarily and think you and, and make you believe you're a duck and make you quack around a room like they do in Vegas? That actually only works for a small percentage of people in the audience. Yeah. But a hypnotherapist who can guide you through a, a, a self-reflection where you are awake, you can hear exactly what's going on, but he can reprogram your beliefs. That's what Paul McKenna does. That's what Marissa Peer does. Both of them are on Mind Valley. That is truly powerful stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think I think hypnotism. It they they put that into a public act, and often you need the audience yeah. there so that the yeah. person can act foolish and and kind of you know it's really narcissism at work. But I do believe in in hypnotism where it's like a private one on one session. I've had a friend that quit smoking because of it as well. So I'm I'm a big believer in it for sure. Yeah. Um, so so hypnotherapy has become so, so popular in Mind Valley. We provide hypnotherapy as a service to our team members. We even have a hypnotherapy room. We have certified uh, Marissa Peer hypnotherapist. Um, and if, if, if a team member is going through a health issue or going through an emotional issue, boom, the hypnotherapist helps them deal with it. And it's really powerful. Is, that, is health one of the most common issues? where it's mental health or it's a, it's a habit? What are, what are some of the strange cases that you've seen where hypnotism has helped? Um, well, they, they, they are many. Healing eyesight, that has happened. Eyesight, um, like you can't improving see? Skin. Yeah, well, think about this, for example, right? People with, with multiple personality disorder, not, not that you cannot see, not that, you're, um, that, that you, have, you, you have vision that is corrupted. People with multiple personality disorder, this is a really interesting scientific phenomenon. When different personalities take control of their body, their eyesight changes. Think about that. It is mind-blowing. Um, their eyesight changes. We had a Silva student, Sister Barbara Burns, right? So she was a nun and she was legally blind. And in one year, she was able to toss away her glasses. She, she was legally blind because her myopia was so high, she needed really thick glasses. So she would meditate in the morning. So when you wake up in the morning, you're naturally in the alpha level of mind for about five minutes before you start going about your day. This is a good time to sit in bed, meditate, and visualize. So Sister Barbara Burns would repeat this affirmation to herself. Every time I blink my eyes, my vision gets better, better, and better. Every time I blink my eyes, my vision gets better, better, and better. In one year, she restored her eyesight. So when you say multiple multi personality disorder, you're saying she had maybe four different personalities. No, which no, I no. Think she did not. She was just no. I'm saying people with okay. with multiple personality disorder, their vision changes as new personalities emerge. This proves that vision is not just a function of the eyes; it's a function of the mind. Sister Barbara Burns showed how if you are able to tap into an altered state, the alpha level, early in the morning. You can program your mind, program your body, program your body to self-heal. Interesting. So really what you're saying is it's all in the mind and in our brain. That, that's a simplistic way of saying it. Mm -hmm. But for example, imagery therapy has been studied even for terminal illnesses like cancer. What they found that is in three to four percent of cases, cancer patients who practice imagery therapy, um, three to four percent of the time, they were able to completely eliminate their cancer. Dr. O. Carl Simonton of the Simonton Cancer Research Institute did an experiment with some several hundred cancer patients. Three to four percent of them went into complete remission. Their cancer disappeared. He took a group of people who were given 12 months to live. And after one year, they had extended um, th th their diagnosis now, gave them, sorry, he took a group of patients who had 12 months to live and he extended it to 24 months on average. He basically gave them 12 extra months. Now, he wow. didn't cure most of them. Only 3 to 4% completely had the cancer disappear. But doubling that, that lifespan is still pretty impressive. What he used was the silver method. 
Uh, he called it imagery therapy, but he later went on record to say about the Silva system, it is the single most important tool I have to offer patients. Yeah, yeah. It's incredible how you can just tap off all these memories and really spit out data that are that you just have learned and memorized. Well, I saw an interview over well, you were doing this uh, memory te- visualization technique. I'd love to go through this right. with you because I have a terrible memory. You walk me well, into well, like a, a room well, of well, 20 well, people. Then- yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well. Look, I talk about mind valley programs because mind valley programs are the single best thing you can spend your money on. Why is my brain so powerful? Superbrain. Superbrain is our best-selling program. It's by Jim Quick. Mindvalley.com forward slash Superbrain. Go check it out. Yeah, I but love my Jim. brain is so freaking optimized because I work with Jim Quick. He's my memory trainer. Right. And just for people that don't know, Jim Jim Quick is a uh, he's he's trained some of the high level actors and he's actresses the number around the world in Hollywood. In the world. And just yeah. and just an amazing guy. I'd love to go over some of his some of his techniques. We can give a shout out to him, of course, just to go through an exercise. Uh, I think one of the ones that you may have done was like a grocery item or something like that. But you yeah, were able that, to that's, visualize that's really yeah. easy. Yeah, yeah. Let's do a simple one for the audience. Well, well. Um, so, so it's a classic classic technique from Superbrain. Um, your brain remembers things which are unusual, right? Unusual. So, if you have a grocery list. Uh, So give me an item. Avocado. Avocado. Okay. So we can all visualize an avocado. Now give me the second item. Um, Let's see. You want something a little bit off, right? No, no, no. Anything. Okay. okay. Egg whites. Egg whites. Okay. Avocado, egg whites. And what else? Celery. Celery. Okay. Well, let's just say avocado, eggs, and celery. Okay. So you want to create a link between avocado and eggs and you want to make that link weird, weird or funny or sexual. So you could imagine an avocado and an egg making out. They both have faces and they are, they are like kissing each other and it's weird because they are two different species <laughs> or whatever. And, and they're worried yeah. about how society is going to like, like, like see them. And, <laughs> and, and the egg is telling the avocado how he's, he or she is so in love with the avocado because he's so green and prickly, whatever. It's yeah. freaking disgusting and bizarre. But yeah. you're now going to remember avocado egg. Now, egg and celery. Now, here you might imagine yourself eating an omelet with celery in it, and it's disgusting, and you feel that sensation in your mouth. Um, but you've now made a link between the egg and the celery. Now, you keep doing this down the list. Typically, people can do around 20. And what you will find is avocado will trigger the memory of egg. Egg will trigger the memory of celery. But it's, you can also do it backwards. Celery will trigger the memory of egg. Egg will trigger the memory of avocado. You either me- remember the first item or the last item, and everything else will fall in like a chain. So the first one, it always has to be connected. So avocado has to be related yeah. to something that is to an egg. Egg, egg, egg to is celery. To celery. Celery is connected to, to carrot or whatever is the fourth item. And it has and to that's be weird, funny, or sexual. Weird, funny, or sexual. Yeah. Of course, yeah. it's sexual for humans. Huh? <laughs> yeah, weird, funny, or sexual. Um, yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, so that's, and how do you, how would you translate that into names? Let's say you meet 20 people and one of the really gifted talents that Bill Clinton had was he would go to a fundraiser, meet 50, 100 people, and he would remember facts, not only just the name, but remember facts about the 15th person that he met that he's never met in his life. Uh, how yeah. can you translate that kind of technique into remembering names? Cause so many people are bad at it like myself. Well, they are, they, are, they, are, they are two different things, okay? So I'm going to teach you two different methods. The first is, again, funny, weird, sexual. You take a name and you turn it into something funny, weird, sexual, and you match it to that person's face. So I once <laughs> gave a, a talk in Germany, okay? And I was able to remember the names of one third of everyone in the room. So people would raise their hand. I'd, I'd remember their name. And then later when they'd come to me for a book signing, and there were about maybe 300 people in the room, one in three times I could remember the name and I didn't have to ask them. I would just say, so your name is Gunther, right? Great. And here's, here's the book. And people were so shocked wow. um, because I remembered close to a hundred names. But what I'm doing is I'm converting the name into a sound, matching that sound to the head. Okay. So, sorry, matching that sound to the face. So let me ask you a question. What is an unusual feature about my face? Mm. You really want to go there, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um unusual feature mm. i think you have more white hair in your beard than your than your okay than your great hair. 
Yeah. White hair on my beard. All right. Great. So what is my name? Vision. Okay. When you think of the word vision, what is an object that you can associate with the name vision? I think of someone, well, I would think of vision. Vision sounds like visions. Vision sounds like I could relate vision with someone that's like wise, someone that generally is related to someone that has uh, white hair, right? You could do that. Yes. That's great. That's what I think at least. But let's make it weirder. That's the word. What object comes to mind when you think of vision? I think of light bulb. Light bulb? Okay. So now you imagine. Great. So it could be eyeballs. It could be light bulb. It could be a TV. So light bulb is cool. Um, You could see on my my white beard, you could see each strand of beard holding a little white bulb. Light Mm. bulb. Right? Mm. But you could make it even weirder. Picture an eyeball, a disgusting, slimy eyeball that's been pulled out of someone's face. Each white strand of my beard is holding a disgusting, slimy eyeball. The little eyeballs hanging under my chin. Disturbing as fuck. But you're going to remember that. And that's how you remember names. Now, we can do the same thing with you. Now, you have a very common name, Sean. Um, So when I think of Sean, I think of flashlight, shone, like like, like, like Mm. a light shining or Sean. Um, I I can't think of anything else that comes to mind. Now, I notice you have a little tuft of hair that that goes this way. Yeah. So I remember, I I imagine a little flashbulb. So sorry, not flash bulb, but a little flashlight swinging on your hair this way, forward, backwards, forward, backwards, forward, backwards. Now, when I see you, my brain will remember that tuft of hair. It'll remember the torchlight. And if I get it right, it will link to the word Sean. Wow, interesting. And you would still remember that if I was to change my hair? Like, what if I had a wig on? No, then it becomes problematic, right? Right. But, but but the funny thing that happens is just doing this exercise, doing this exercise will automatically, even if you change your hair, because I've made the effort to consciously do this exercise, I'm more likely to remember your name. And the other thing that, that that's interesting is that um, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Yes. Yeah. So you were able to remember a hundred names yeah. through this yeah. conference that you were doing just through that. Exactly. Now, as, as a record, I was able to remember a 50-digit number backwards and forwards. A 50-digit number. Okay, we got to do this. Backwards and forwards. We you have to try do this. We okay, have well, to look, do this. I'm not Jim Quick. I'm not Jim Quick. I know, I know. We, can, we don't have to do 50. Uh, let me just okay. write down a number. Okay. Hold on. Ah, Is this going to be interesting for your audience, though? Actually, oh, let, let, sure. let's go on to something else because you're, okay. you're asking me about Jim Quick stuff. But yes. I'm not Jim Quick. That's true. That's true. That's true. Um, well, we can go over something really quick in terms of how to memorize, let's say, a 20-digit number. Uh, yeah, I can try. Let's if do that. Like. Okay, so, so you're going to give me this 20-digit number, two digits at a time. And, okay. And you have to write it down. I'll write it down. I have it here. Okay, and for the great for the video people. Give me give me two digits at a time. Okay, right. and let, let's let's set a timer. I'm going to set a timer on my phone so we can see how fast this can happen. And audience, you're free to play along. Go ahead. Yeah, and make sure you guys watch the video for this one in case you're missing out. Yeah. All right, fifty-eight. Okay. Three seven. Okay. Let me okay. know when you want me to go on. Three nine. Yeah, keep keep going. Uh, three seven three nine. Two okay. nine, eight seven. Okay. One second. Okay. Two three. Mhm. Four five. Mhm. Five four. Mhm. Two three. Eight eight. I don't know if that's twenty, but okay. Sake yeah. Of time. So so let let's let's go. Um. Let let's let's do this. Okay. So the first one was five eight. Yes, sir. Okay. Five eight three seven. Yeah. Uh, three nine. Yep. Uh, two nine. Yep. Um, two nine, and then it was eight six. Eight. You want me to correct it? Eight six eight seven something like that. Eight seven, yep, yeah, you, you got it. Me. You got eight, it. You seven. got it. Okay, and then it was two three, then yep. four five. Yep. 
um, four five, and then it was five four yep. two three. Yep. And then eight eight. Now can right? you do it and backwards? You do it, yeah, you can do it backwards. <laughs> backwards, so okay. It was eight eight. It, it was eight eight three two. Mm-hmm. Um, three two. So backwards takes a little bit. Um, oh, for sure. It's, of it's four tough. four five. Four yep. five. Um, five four. Yeah. Um. Three two. Yep. Seven eight. Yep. Seven eight. Nine two. Nine two. Yeah. N- nine three. Yep. Four more. Um. Eight three. Oh, so close. Eight seven. Eight five. Yeah. 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 It was it was seven three eight five. Wow. Yeah, so that's that was insane. a twenty number. Okay. This is with wine. This is off yeah, the cuff. So, no preparation. So you, know what, what's, so you know what's really funny? I never drink when I'm doing a podcast because I know even a little bit of wine will will influence your cognition. For sure. I just I didn't know you were gonna make me. I know, I know. <laughs> I definitely encourage people to try that and, and check out the program. So I know you've done ayahuasca. That that's a that was a that was something that I wanted to kind of dig into as well, just because that uh, seems to have really transformed the way you think. And you've done it mm-hmm. a few times now. So what was, uh, I, I guess, like, who was the one that initially got you into it? And and how, how did, did you prepare for something like this before? Have you done LSD? Have you done shrooms before that? Or was that just something yeah, you decided yeah. to dig into? Well, 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 actually, I did, I did, I'm trying to think. I did Aya before I did anything else. Uh, ayahuasca, it's illegal in some countries, so you want to make sure you're doing it in a place where it's legal. Uh, it should be legal because it's a powerful indigenous tool. As Stephen Kotler said, in the Western world, we are trained to look at life in a monophasic way, but in many indigenous cultures, people live in a polyphasic world. In other words, people are operating in multiple brainwave states. I did ayahuasca with the Achua tribe in the Ecuadorian rainforest. And the Achua are one of several dream people. Dream people, uh, these are very common. There's the Achua tribe in the Amazon. There's a tribe in Malaysia. These are indigenous tribes that live in rainforests. And because, you know, when you're living in a thick um, equatorial rainforest, normal ways of communication don't work. You don't have telephones. Um, Moving is hard because you're moving through plants. And these indigenous cultures evolved a way of communicating in their dreams. So the Achua have some interesting traditions. At 4 a.m., the tribe's people wake up. They gather around a campfire and they start sharing stories of their dreams. Who visited them? What messages did they get? Where, what did their dead relatives say? What did relatives or friends in other parts of the rainforest, what are those relatives or friends warning them about? Now, sure, maybe it's all made up. Maybe there's no truth in this. But here's where the story gets weird. Why was I sitting in an Amazon rainforest with a tribe that had only been discovered in 1979? Well, my friend Lynn Twist who's one of the foremost um, philanthropists in the world. Lynn, Lynn Twist, uh, is, uh, she wrote a book called Soul of Money. She, read a, she, she led a program um, that helped feed a million people in, in South Asia. Lynn Twist is an amazing like, like champion of, of humanity. And one day, Lynn, this remarkable um, nonprofit leader, started seeing these brown, indigenous-looking men in her dreams calling her, and they had red streaks on their face. And she couldn't understand who were these men who kept coming to her in her dreams. And so she went, one day she was talking to another friend, and she described these men to her friend. And her friend goes, you know, you're talking about the Achua of Ecuador. It's an indigenous tribe that was discovered in 1979. And they have these red paints on their face. It's, it's their markings. Would you like to go meet them? Maybe they're calling you. And so Lynn went to the Amazon, met the Achua tribe, and the shaman said, We've been expecting you. So think about what's going on there. She didn't get a letter. She didn't get an email. This tribe was calling her. They somehow knew to chose her. Maybe they put out an intention in their dreams to find them, the best person they could find who could help them with their problem. Now, what was their problem? The Amazon rainforest was being cut down. Mm. Now, it turned out Lynn was the perfect person to help them with their problem. She's a champion fundraiser. She's connected to billionaires and she helps raise like all of this money to help save the planet. 
together with the Achua, Lin, Lin Twist was able to preserve millions upon million acres of Amazon land. I forgot what the number was. It's anywhere between four to 10 million. It's changed. Um, and it was truly remarkable. So I was there, incidentally, in 2009 with my then wife, with Jim Quick. We were all, and, and Jim and I were friends because before we started working together, we were there in the Amazon rainforest. And, you know, we both donated, um, I, I remember I donated, I think, around $35,000 to help buy Amazon land to, you, to preserve yeah. it. And that was my first ayahuasca experience. And so ayahuasca is a way of tapping into an altered state and, 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 and coming up with new intuitive ideas. Most recently, I did ayahuasca in January. Um, and I had a remarkable experience for seven hours straight. Something spoke to me and gave me the specifications of a new app to build, a new app. And I went for it and I started building it. But to build it, I needed to, to, to get in touch with some really powerful experts in augmented reality. Okay, mm -hmm. people who had been doing cutting, cutting edge work in augmented reality. And as it turned out, it, it, the, the universe or whatever was speaking to me during ayahuasca didn't just give me the vision. It started paving the way. And so three days after the ayahuasca experience, I found myself, I'd been introduced to a top AR expert. And I sat down with him and I'm like, I need to know if your technology can do this because I need this for this app I'm going to build. And I said, but I need to tell you, there's no research or, or data that says this is going to work. I'm going with my gut here. And, I, and you may laugh at me and you may say no and you may think I'm crazy, but I got this in a seven-hour download during ayahuasca. Half expecting him to go, sorry, I'm not interested. You know, But instead, he goes, ayahuasca, that's so amazing. I'm doing it this Sunday. Literally that same week, he was doing his first ayahuasca experience. You see, Aya has become so predominant in Silicon Valley that one entrepreneur, I won't share his name, but one entrepreneur said, any CEO who is not using plant medicine in this day and age is at a competitive disadvantage. I was able to conceive to intricate detail a vision for a new app to create. You will be seeing this app. Um, it's, it's, now, it's now exclusively available for Mindvalley. In fact, you can, act, you can actually go check it out right now, Connections by Mindvalley. You can't use it because it's a private app just for Mindvalley, uh, Mindvalley students. Um, but that app came to me in ayahuasca. And it's turned out to be like hyper successful. Right. And the, you said there's voices. I mean, really, it's, you're saying it's, it's your own voice. The, uh, there was probably ideas formulated in experiences yeah. that you've had, articles you've read, uh, lectures you've seen, but you just weren't able to connect it. And the no, voice that you no, heard no, no, was no. you, right? See, that, that's, that's the mistake. In mm -hmm. polite society, we say, oh, intuition ayahuasca, plant medicine, all it's doing is it's like, it's accelerating your, your natural intelligence. And so you're just bringing back stuff that you've already observed. No, you're tapping into something outside yourself. Your definition of self will have to change. You're tapping into something outside yourself. And, and what happens is that you get insights. Some people may hear a voice that's called clairaudience. Some people see a vision that's called clairvoyance. Some people feel something, it's called clairsentience. These are all different labels for types of intuitive insight. What I got was thought bubbles, thought bubbles. So like, like the insight would come to me as a completely formed thought. The best way of explaining it is it's not that like I'm hearing the English language. A thought bubble enters my head and I see the front screen for the app. And then I ask a question, what happens after people do the screen? Boom, a thought bubble enters my head. And some of these thought bubbles are freaking radical. One of the thought bubbles said this, when you build this app, be sure, promise me that you will not use user data to sell them advertising like Facebook and Instagram does. Promise me you will not do that. If you do that, this will not work. If you make that promise right now, you will get everything you need. The investors, the success, everything will be easy. But you have to go against the grain and build an app, a social network style app that doesn't use that doesn't use advertising. 
You don't think that so, was your own intuition telling yourself because it could because of no, the, because the, it the makes morals no freaking and... business sense. It makes mm-hmm. no freaking business sense. But yesterday, I, I I happened to watch that new Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, and it yes. talks about how how bad advertising on Facebook and Instagram is. I didn't know that in January. I knew it was bad. I didn't know it was that bad. But I agreed. I agreed that there'd be no advertising in this app. And I'm, I'm publicly saying it right now because if I now were to break my pack with whatever was speaking to me, you know, I, 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 I don't feel I deserve this idea. So I have to stick to that. And my investors have to know that. There will be no freaking advertising. We will not be whoring out our users' data like Facebook and Instagram does. Mm, mm. We're not going to Zuckerberg this app. And, and, but that is the type of insights that you get. They are noble. They are true. It felt like the universe was saying, you need to build this new social network for learning, but you have to do it by our standards and our rules, or we take away the idea from you. <laughs> that is so cool. And who, who do you think, is, it, you're saying it's just an external voice that's giving you this idea, right? Because you keep saying they. Yeah. So, so who knows what they is? Maybe mm-hmm. it's what Carl Jung calls the morphogenetic deal. Maybe it's collective human consciousness. Maybe it is a higher power. Maybe it's God. We don't have the language to interpret what that is. Um, I have no idea. But I know yeah. that it was this wise guidance. And, and it seemed to give me really clear insights. And then as I followed those insights, as I followed those tips, it wasn't just intuition anymore. The world would bend. The universe would literally bend. Synchronicities, coincidences would happen. And the right people would fall on my lap as I started pursuing this idea. Elizabeth Gilbert says, yeah. the universe doesn't play favorites. It will whisper an idea in you. And you can choose to take it or you can choose to ignore it. If you ignore it, it doesn't matter. The universe doesn't care. It's the freaking universe for God's sake. It'll just go and whisper that idea to the next person. But if you seize the idea, if you raise your hand and you say, yes, I will do this, the universe will back you. The universe is like your boss. Think about it this way. If your boss asked you to do a project and you said, yes, I will do it, will your boss make it hard for you? No. Your boss will give you the budget. Your boss will give you the money. The boss will give you the connections. Your boss needs you to succeed. Likewise, when that universe whispers in you and you raise your hand, know that Even if you don't have the information right now or the funding right now or the ideas right now, if you commit, your boss will give you the right assets, the right resources to make it happen. The world is an illusion and we can poke this, we can prod this, we can change things. And once you understand this, your life will never be the same again. By the way, that quote came from Steve Jobs, didn't come from me. Steve Jobs, if you read his book, by Walter Isaacson, believed in intuition. In his famous Stanford address, he said, listen to your heart and intuition. They somehow already know who you are meant to be. In the book by Walter Isaacson, it says, Job's belief in prana or an intuitive way of understanding the world. He believed that there were certain people who were mystics or gurus, and he believed that he was one of them. Mm -hmm. That's a direct quote from Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. Let's stop trying to, to say that Oh, we have to explain this by science. No, science is incomplete. There are many things science cannot explain. For thousands of years, human beings did not know what the sun was. The Egyptians believe it was the god Ra riding his chariot across the sky. Other cultures believe it was a giant, uh, it was a giant flaming fireball. Today we know the sun is a massive thermonuclear reaction, primarily hydrogen and helium atoms, right? We know the size of the sun, we know its relative distance from Earth, but it didn't mean that. Before, when we didn't know what the sun was, we couldn't use it. We used it for heat. We used it for navigation. We used it for warmth. We used it for light. But we didn't freaking know what it was. If we decide, oh, I'm not going to do intuition because I need to figure out what this really is. Is this the brain's reticular activating system? Is this, is this my, my cognition on superpower? Am I tapping into something else? I need to know. Then I'll think about using it. Well, that's so freaking limiting. Don't yeah. do that. Do you know? Can you explain what, how your cell phone works? Most people can. I have a freaking computer engineering degree, and I can explain completely how an iPhone works. Not going to stop me from using it. So why do we put that same label on intuition, on manifesting, on all of these spiritual art forms? Yeah, no, I believe it. I believe it. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering for the mainstream audience that 
isn't as intuitively in sync with their soul, with their thoughts and, and through meditation, through really working on themselves, what's the mindset they need to be? Are you saying anyone is, anyone that is listening to this can go into ayahuasca? Because I've had people that have very negative experiences as well. With No, it, also, it, it depends, yeah. right? I'm, I'm not saying it's always going to work. It, it, it's about preparation. It's about the shaman you choose. And I'm not advocating ayahuasca. I'm saying altered states. Ken Wilber, the great American uh, philosopher and spiritual teacher, said our education system doesn't prepare us for mm. the full concept of being human. It doesn't even teach us human 101. It teaches human one-tenth. And he said human 101 is being able to access all of these states, not just waking consciousness, but the dream state, but but the, the, the samadhi experience of oneness, higher awareness. And he said, none of these are weird or occult or mystic. They simply are, and they are part of the human experience. That's Ken Wilber for you, one of America's smartest men, IQ 175. Now, altered states is the answer. In Daniel Goleman's book, Altered Traits, which is about altered states, he says there are four ways to get there, neurotraining, Best protocol on this is 40 years of Zen by Dave Asprey, but it's 15 grand, expensive. Neurotraining training is when you put electrodes on your head. The second one is meditation. The third one is plant medicine. The fourth one is breath work. Of these, the most effective, the most effective are meditation and breath work. So plant medicine is expensive. Neurotraining training is expensive and, and not very reliable. Breath work is popping up everywhere. And meditation anybody can do. Okay, now the difference, breath work will put you into an altered state. People have revelations, people have insights, people feel, feel, feel guides talking to them, people have breakdowns, but you often cannot control what you're going to experience. With meditation, you go into an altered state that you have direct control, you're driving the car. One, breath work, the car is being driven for you and you don't know the destination, but you will get an insight. Meditation, you're driving the car. So you go straight to the problem you want to solve. Well, I know you're running out of time, so I want to I wanna make yeah. sure that the audience could find you. Mind Valley, of course. Right. Uh, and where else can people find you on social media, Vision? Follow me at Vision, at V-I-S-H-E-N, and um, share your thoughts, yeah. On, on, my, on, on whatever post you see that's up next, just mention this interview and mention your favorite insight. Just go to at Vision right now. Um, just comment on um because i i want to i want to get feedback this is a really unusual interview because you took me sean and, and kudos to you for keeping it so fresh you took me to so many different directions um i don't know what landed with the audience but you know i wanted to do my best to to make this fascinating and intriguing if you could do me a favor follow me at vision and just comment and let me know what was your greatest insight comment on on whatever is my last post right um i greatly appreciate that thank you